You find yourself standing in a brightly lit room inside a tower devoid of any uniquely identifying features. Your journey here was a relatively uneventful one. Other than meeting an interesting chap who'd regaled you with tales of his newly found deity, you'd not yet really encountered anything out of the ordinary. Finding the tower wasn't difficult thanks to the trusty map in your pocket, and gaining entry had proved far easier than you might have expected. Scanning the room, nothing really catches your eye at first. Then in your peripheral vision, you spot movement. You spin to see what might be there, and that's when you catch sight of the challenge that lays ahead of you. Good morning, the vaguely humanoid figure speaks. Glad to see you're here. I'm the project manager. Let's get started. I've been playing tabletop games for years now. I've been an observer. I've been a player. I've been a dungeon master. I've run multiple rule systems. I generally always have a set of dice in my bag or nearby on my desk. If you're a previous D&D player and at any point you feel like scoffing, oh, that's wrong, What's your dis what you're describing is actually a sorcerer, not a wizard. Quite frankly, I don't care. Um, this is a simplified talk. It's not a deep dive into Dungeons and Dragons. This is designed for people who have played before and those that haven't. I'm simplifying things for the narrative of the story that I'm going to tell here. So just so we're clear, this is a game. Just because my fun is different to your fun doesn't make my fun wrong. It doesn't make your fun wrong. These are different things. It's just a game. This is a bit of fun. So, hi, my name's Matt. Uh, I'm 33 years old. I'm a nerd. I like Jaffa Cakes. I hate beetroot. Um, I was in my stats uh, that I was rolling for myself on this. Originally, I was going to put my constitution a little bit higher because I pre you know, thought, you know, in previous years, I've done okay down the pub with friends. And then my fiance reminded me that I'm asthmatic and catch colds in the summer. So maybe it's not that great in, in reality. Um, but we have some physical characteristics here. My strength, my constitution and my dexterity. You know, my strength, my ability to keep going and how agile I am. And my mental characteristics, how wise I am, how intelligent I am and how charismatic I am. If I'm here talking to you, then I hope that I'm somewhat charismatic. But, you know, I'll let you be the judge of that. This scraggly old chap is an 80-year-old wizard known as Mordecai Solomon. He likes books and dislikes people. His technical skills are testing algorithms and databases. His complementary skills, he's good with the communication, user experience, creativity. Nah, he's not so, great, not so great with those things. For the people here who haven't played it before and the people that have, D&D was summed up in a really nice little one-line uh, description by a friend of mine once. Essentially, we roll dice to see if stuff happens while we all play make-believe, which at first sort of hearing might not sound a lot like the software world, but trust me, we'll get into it. Things are a lot more similar than you might first think. Um, but what's meant by that is each time you want to do something in the game, attack a monster, pick a lock, convince someone that you're telling the truth when in reality you're lying, you roll a dice. And depending on the number on that dice depends on whether you succeed or fail and whatever consequences you might face off the back of that. You usually play with a group of friends. There's a dungeon master who helps lead you through things. Um, and they sort of set the world and build the world around you. <clears throat> now, I tell you this to give you a little bit of background. So if you haven't played before, it's kind of a little bit of a background just to help ease you into some of the things we're going to be talking about. But considering the name of Dungeons and Dragons, in reality, we're in an environment and we have problems to solve. In software, we work in an office, we work remotely, we work with people, we have an environment around us and we have problems to solve. So first tentative connection is that in reality, these two things, they're not actually that different. We're put in a situation and told to achieve a goal. How we do that is up to us, mostly. The dungeon master is the world builder. They set the challenges, they steer the story, they help the players through their quest. They make sure that the challenges in front of the party are engaging. Much like the people that are a little bit outside of the software team should be assisting the team through what they're doing. They shouldn't be a blocker to it. They should be helping them tell their story, helping them build that feature, helping them work towards the goal that everyone wants to be working towards. Ultimately, both in Dungeons and Dragons and software development, that means you might not go in directions that people are expecting. But those offshoots, those different directions that you can take, that's where some of the best ideas can lie. Our story begins with you. In Dungeons and Dragons, there's attributes that every player has. 
how good they are with specific things might depend on their physical or mental abilities. They might prioritize and have values in different places and they have alignments. An alignment is a categorization of your ethical, ethical and your moral perspective. Most versions of the game feature some sort of good versus evil and law versus chaos type system. Ultimately, it boils down to, do you follow tradition and sacrifice yourself for others? But perhaps you're closed minded and afraid to approach new things that come your way. Or do you act flexibly and adapt really quickly, which makes you great at taking on new challenges, but potentially you might act in a reckless manner because you're doing the unexpected all the time. Do you do it to protect others or do you do it for personal gain? When considering alignments like this in Dungeons and Dragons, it's a good idea a lot of the time to have a mix of them. Some of them are bad and should be avoided, but some sort of mix so that not everyone is just agreeing and saying the same things all the time is a good thing to have. Just the same as in software development. You might need someone who speaks up and disagrees with that person who's always trying to get their own way. Now, constant disagreement will be a source of uh, friction within the team and might not work. But if everyone just constantly agreed with what that person says to do, you don't have a team of people. You have one person telling everyone else what to do and a bunch of minions. My alignment, I would consider myself neutral good. But if you're my boss, you might say I'm more chaotic sometimes. Um, perspective matters on this one. <laughs> uh, but generally, I consider myself, I stay fairly neutral on things as much as I can, but I'm always working towards the good of the product of the people, of the people we're impacting, of the team. I try to make that my, my main focus. So you've probably all noticed the hat already. Wizards are the magical, mystical, all-powerful code slingers. They crave knowledge. They crave new things to learn. They want to gain all possible skills within their areas of expertise. They're highly intelligent, knowledge-seeking masters of strange and mystical powers, both in Dungeons and Dragons and software development. And they're able to understand and comprehend languages and symbols that mere mortals can't even get their head around. Wizards are great with algorithms. They know them inside and out. They cast fireballs in Dungeons and Dragons, or they tackle that weird logic loop that no one else understands that sits 4,000 lines deep in that legacy class with a little comment that says, here be dragons. They sit alone with their books and their knowledge and they hammer away at their keyboard solving things. They're great, right? Like in D&D, &D, code wizards often put all of their eggs into one basket and they're all about one particular thing and they don't want to branch out. They might seem all powerful and that they can conquer everything, but beware the high-level wizard that solves simple problems to make it look smarter than they really are. A man walks into a large room. He's been sent here to seek a number of other people out for a task of great importance. He heads to the bar, buys a drink, and as he turns, he sees the people he's meant to meet sat at a table. Greetings, he exclaims. I'm Mordecai Solomon, senior software engineer, and I might be 80, but I'm as good as they come. I'm agile and I'm fragile. An elf at the table sighs. So you're who they sent, typical. An old man who's as frail as he is annoying. Well, I guess if you're who they sent, it's better than nothing. I'm Makaria, senior software engineer and code wizard. Ebenezer von Helmont, the second person speaks up. Senior software engineer, backend specialist and code wizard. Hello there, the third voice pops up. The man looks over and sees a gnome sitting before them covered in elaborate jewels and elegant robes. She has a smile on her face and a sparkle in her hand, and she says, Care is the name. Backend software and code wizardry is my game. Everyone wants to be the wizard. Everyone wants to be the shiny, sparkly spell flinger who solves all the problems, the magic user who has all the fun tricks up their sleeves. Everyone wants to be the hero in their story. Wizards work for their own purposes, and they all have the best ideas. They don't need to be told what other people what to do. So surely if one wizard is good, then a whole team of them is going to be amazing. The vaguely humanoid figure silently reappears in the doorway. Hello team. The client has asked us to venture forth to the castle of credit reporting and retrieve the crystal of financial viability. This is a task of great importance and a reward of bowling and jam filled nuts of dough awaits you at the end of your quest. Immediately, all four wizards look very excited and exclaim the exact same thing. I know what I'm doing. 
We can use the path of the 31 scrums to reach our goal, cries Mordecai. Macaria chimes in. Yes, but I have this map that clearly shows the caverns of Kubernetes are the way to reach that castle. Kara runs off shouting, I'll go seek out Master Azure. We can use the magical construct of machine learning to aid us in our quest. Ebenezer von Helmont sits silently for a few seconds and says, I've done it. Once again, I've saved the day with my magical code. We don't even need to go to the castle. So much for that team of great programmers and wizards being great. There was no requirements gathering. There was no conversation, no clear direction. Everyone ran off in their own way and knew what they were doing. They were each out working for their own purpose and their own interpretation of what the problem is. There's no team here. It's four wizards who just happen to be given the same task. They run off and frantically solve the problem, but they haven't considered anyone else in the team. There's no planning, there's no thinking, there's a just do it attitude. And sometimes that can have its place, but mostly it's just a recipe for disaster. We'll get started now and we can plan later. In reality, turns into do first, plan never. But hey, if there's no plan, you can't be off plan, right? Smart thinking from the wizards there. We have a team of wizards. We have a lopsided team of know-it-alls. And balance in Dungeons and Dragons means having people with different skill sets, different areas of expertise, different backgrounds, different experiences, different values. In D&D, you have a fighter, a cleric, a rogue, a warrior, a wizard. All of these different people have different experiences and skill sets. You're not always trying to kill dragons or revolutionize the world with new features in your application. You're sneaking through a city trying to remain unseen. You're hunting down that obscure bug in that file that no one's been able to solve in years. You're disarming traps as you tra track a bandit through a forest. And you're fending off distractions and meeting requests and emails from that guy Steve in finance who keeps sending you cat gifts and, well, they're adorable. It's not actually that helpful to your job. You're negotiating to lower the price of a magic wand that you're trying to buy. Or you're talking with management to explain that while they might want the background change to an animated picture of a spaceship, it's probably not the biggest priority for your team right now. A balanced party leads to more possibilities. And you don't always have the same approach to everything because everyone can bring something different to the table. Each party member has different skills. Now, that's not to say that the rogue is always picking locks or hunting bugs. It doesn't mean the fighter is always doing communications or fending off enemies. But they've got their area of expertise in the areas that they excel in. All charging off to power through code without any kind of teamwork, it never works. It's a team of power-hungry people and it's you're going to get nowhere. You're not just developers, you're problem solvers. You're, you've got different minds, different skills. And honestly, when writing software, a lot of the time, the best software is that software that isn't written. The easiest line of code to debug is a line that never got written. So why write it in the first place? If you can solve it in other ways, that's the approach you should take. But if you have a team of know-it-all wizards who only care about backend software and, al and algorithms, they're going to want to solve every problem with code because that's the way they think. So in reality, we have a much more balanced party. A few minutes after silently disappearing from the doorway, the project manager reappears in a puff of smoke. Team, our clients have heard of this amazing new technology that all the other adventuring parties are using. They believe that if we use this, we will beat all of our competition. As such, it's a requirement that you take this, the mighty block of chain, and complete your task using it. The project manager disappears, maybe five seconds after talking. And they leave behind a large stone block, five feet on each side. It's got a wrought iron chain attached to it. How are we going to carry this, complains the wizard. It's too big, even for all of us. Even if we could, it will slow us down. And I just don't see how this is going to help us reach the castle. Forget it, the fighter says. We don't need it. We've been given a task, and if they complain about it, we'll explain how this blockchain doesn't really solve the problem that we're working on here. You're given a client by a task giver. And in Dungeons and Dragons, the immediate reaction to any kind of controversy is, I'm going to draw my sword and stab them. Now, that might work in Dungeons and Dragons sometimes. It definitely doesn't work with software. Doesn't, doesn't work. But that doesn't mean you can't fight your side. However, it's not always about being hostile and aggressive towards the other person. 
it's not about going out fighting. Communication is a big point of this. That fighter in the team who they're great with fending off and enemies. And in your team, they're the person that's great at dealing with communication from management and project managers. And they're good at explaining those, those sorts of things. They'll be the one to go to them and explain how this doesn't fit your, your, your way of working or the technology doesn't fit the type of problem you're trying to solve. You need to know your battles though. It's not to say get aggressive, but you need to know when you need to stand up for yourself and not just roll over. And for the people outside of the team who give them these sorts of requirements and expect them to just do what you say, you should value trust over control. You shouldn't try and control everything they do. You just trust that they, the people you've hired are good at the job that you hired them for. If they weren't, why did you hire them? You set out on your journey. And after a short while, everything seems to be going quite well. Along the way, you've met a few folks on the path you're on. You've camped out and kept a mon kept monitor for anything in the night that might seek to ambush you. Each time a team is formed, they'll generally go through Tuckman's stages of group development. Now, this is not necessarily a truly scientific method to this sort of thing. There's a lot of people that do refute Tuckman stages of group development. Personally, I found that more often than not, it's something along these lines that teams go through when they form. They go through the forming stage. They're relatively effective. But then they go through the storming phase where it's all loudly voiced opinions and everyone wants to sort of assert their dominance in the team. But then we get to the norming stage where they're moving more towards harmonious working practice. They've all agreed upon code standards and the general approach they're taking to things. And then the performing stage is when they've got they're autonomous, they've got competency, they're motivated, and they've got the knowledge in what they're doing. That's when they hit their peak performance. You wake up one morning after resting. The sun is already bright in the sky, and you hear a voice excitedly say, hey folks, mind if I join you? You see an elven figure, green robe and flowers in their hair. It would appear you've come across a druid who sought to join you on your quest. It's going to happen. You're going to have someone new join your team, or you're going to have someone leave your team. It will upset your team balance. It will upset your team dynamic. They will bring a new skill set. They will alter the skill set of the people within your team, because when you have someone join your team or you have someone leave your team, you don't have a changed team. You have a new team. Teams are immutable. So when someone new joins your team, your dynamic changes. You have to work on finding that new balance because this person has brought a new skill set in that you haven't had before, or they've brought a skill set in that also someone else had, and they're now finding their balance of how things fit across those multiple people. And because of this, they're going to have to go through the forming, the storming, the norming, and the performing stages again, because this is a new team. You've made great progress on your journey. You're nearing the castle. Your fighter turns around to talk to the group. You can see the castle in the distance as you make your final approach. The fighter says, right team, we can see that castle in the distance. Just at the top of the ridge. Rogue, can you go and... Hey team, where's, where's the rogue gone? You suddenly realize your rogue is nowhere to be seen. You're going to have to backtrack and see if you can find the spot where they disappeared along this path. I've seen this happen in lengthy whiteboarding sessions and discussions. I've seen someone switch off and then you go on talking for hours and hours and they lose concentration. And at the end, they're sort of just nodding along blindly. Um, and you ask them if they understand what's happened and they, they're nodding along, but they haven't taken any of it in. They've gone off somewhere in the past, but you don't know where. So what that means from your perspective you can't just go and find them. You can't just go and find wherever they are, the direct path. That's an unknown and an unexplored area of territory. And here be dragons. You don't know what's there. So did they leave at the start of the conversation you were having further along? Or was it more towards the end? Ultimately, if we'd have checked in with everyone at each of these points, we have a much less difficult journey to bring them back onto the same path because they would have been with us near enough and then actually we don't have to backtrack as far to bring them back into the conversation 
check in regularly. If you're ever having a lengthy team discussion, check in with everyone regularly that they actually understand what's being talked about. And if they don't, give them the chance to ask for clarification and make sure that people know that they can ask for clarification. That's a sometimes a difficult team dynamic and team value to instill in people because they think that by asking for clarification, people will see them as not understanding things or, you know, stupid. But in reality, there is no such thing as a stupid question because I can guarantee there was someone else sat in that discussion that wanted to ask that question but didn't and is going to be relieved that it was asked. This especially happens with newer players on a team, um, be it software team or Dungeons and Dragons team. Um, working extensively with apprentices and juniors in my past, um, they would want to sort of keep up with the more senior people and, and wouldn't necessarily feel like they could ask those questions. But once we sort of established with them that it's okay to ask for clarification and even some of the senior people asking for clarification to you know, make them realize if the senior people are asking for it, I can ask for it too. It makes it a lot easier to bring them back onto the path with you if they've not gone too far off of it. You emerge from the forest of wandering data leaks. You've come across a fast running river that wasn't on your map and there's no crossing in sight. The castle you're on your way to is on the other side. You evaluate your options you have within your party and you have four options, you believe. You could try and use some rope to cross the river. You could try and build a bridge. You could let the wizard cast fly on the party and just sail across. Or you could try and find another way around. If we use the rope, it's quick and it's temporary. We only need rope. If we build a bridge, it's really slow and it needs lots of materials, but it's reusable for yourself and others for years to come. Flying is super quick, but it requires the wizard to be able to do that trick that everyone knows they can do, and no one really learns from the experience. If you find another way, it leads to the least preparation and materials, but it's an unknown on how long it will take you to do that, and it might cause you to not find your way around. So do you write that quick script that just fixes the issue once? Do you implement that new system to manage this problem for future people that are going to encounter it? Do you ask your code wizard to just do what they do and make it work so that the rest of you can just carry on with what you're doing? Or do you find a workaround to the problem so you don't even have to solve it? And the correct answer to this is there is no right answer. It depends on the context of where you are, what materials, what capabilities, what people, what skill sets, what time you have. How long have you got to achieve that goal? Because if you need to be there quickly, you're going to use the rope. But if your desire, the desire of this is that actually this is going to be reused over and over again, maybe it's time to build a bridge. So often you're questioned on why you made a decision, but ultimately every decision needs context behind it because there is no, no single right answer. But whichever route you take, don't post about it on Twitter because everyone else will tell you that you're wrong. You've crossed the river and you've made your way across a field. To your left, you can see a large rock, rock formation at the base of a ridge. You spot a cave entrance, and from inside, you can hear a low, guttural growl getting louder and louder. Hey, DM, the fighter player pipes up with. Can I take my warhammer out and try hitting that entrance of the cave? I want to see if I can cave it in and stop whatever's inside coming out and eating us. Oh, the, you can most certainly try, the dungeon master says and it might work. The fighter might hit the rock hard enough to cause it to cave in, or it won't, and something else will happen. But if they didn't ask that particular question, they wouldn't have been able to work out, is that possible? There's no, not necessarily anything in the rule book that says, you know, you can hit a cave entrance and cause a cave in. But the dungeon master's got an element of creative freedom to let people try things that might not be written down. When working on anything, there's always a chance to bend, change, or break the rules. Now, I'm not talking about like um, industry rules, like financial institutions, you can't just go and do whatever you want. There are rules in that situation for a reason. I'm talking about your team rules and the way the team works and approaches problems. If you're not sure you can do something or you want to do something out of the ordinary, ask. You can try something different. If it doesn't work, cool, you've learned something from it. Now. You can't just have everyone breaking the rules all the time. That's a recipe for chaos. That's why you need to have a common starting ground of here's our starting point and we can change and adjust things as we see fit for our team. Start with rules, otherwise it's chaos. But once you've got those rules, that's not to say you're stuck with them for the rest of time. 
in D and D, a natural twenty is the best role you can make. It's usually an automatic success on whatever it is you're trying to do, but it's not something that you can always control. It's down to the hand of fate, as it were. And often when trying new things in software development, it can feel like the same thing. No matter how much we try and control things, sometimes it just goes well or it doesn't, and not everything can be foreseen. And sometimes you roll a natural one, which is the worst roll you can make. Again, it's usually a failure. Sometimes this cannot be avoided. You couldn't have foreseen that that was going to happen, but how you respond to it, that's what matters. Sometimes you roll well and sometimes you don't. If the fighter rolls really well and caves in that entrance, great, you don't have to fight whatever's inside it. But if they don't, well, you might most likely gonna have to fight whatever's in there. But you can use experience and knowledge to try and work out what is in that cave. The growl from the cave gets louder. You might only have a short time before whatever it's inside reaches you. I'd like to try and see if I can figure out what's on the inside of the cave, the wizard says. Do I recognize the growl or know of any creature that would live in this cave? I've read a lot of books, don't you know? After making their role, they've worked out that it's a troll and the troll knows that the, the wizard knows that the troll has a weakness to fire. So whilst there's unknowns coming at you, you can use your past experience to help prepare for you for these unknowns and the things that might happen. Rather than just running into something blind and hitting it with whatever you've got, step back and look at your surroundings. What things are you here that are you familiar with? Do you see markings on the cave that might indicate the type of thing that's inside there? Have you had a similar bug to this before? Is there an interesting smell coming from the cave that you might recognize? Have you seen this technology in a blog post or a conference talk before? Take a few moments to step back from the situation and consider what might help you along this way. It can be the biggest difference between success and failure. The troll, however, also has a chance of damaging anyone who hits it with acid from its wounds. The wizard keeps this knowledge to themselves. They don't feel the need to share it with anyone else. The troll bursts out of the cave with a mighty roar. The party immediately engages it in combat, slashing and attacking in every way they can. But after such a long journey, they're just too tired. The troll looks like it might be about to get the best of them. The fighter hits it with their hammer. The rogue stabs it with the dagger. Each of them screams out in pain as acid splashes against them. Falling to their knees, all seems hopeless. The troll looks like it's ready to finish the fight. The wizard is studying things from afar, however, and they say the three words that every dungeon master loves or hates to hear. I cast fireball. The troll falls to the ground, defeated. Your party turns around and thanks the wizard for ensuring victory in combat and saving their lives. However, your wizard kept information to themselves that nearly cost the party their lives. They knew something that they didn't share with their team, and as a result, the team very nearly failed what they were doing. Knowledge silos are a barrier to effective teamwork. If you have something that might be an important piece of information or knowledge about a particular topic or subject, you should share it with your team. You never know when that sort of thing might be useful. Wizards are often annoying, smart-ass know-it-alls. They've got a superior, superiority complex. They don't know how to keep their egos in check. The good ones do, and they do share knowledge. They don't see knowledge as a thing to be hoarded. They see knowledge as a thing to be shared. Those are the people that you want in your team. Sometimes you might need someone to do that magic thing they can do that no one else can to fix the problem. But they should also then use that as a teaching opportunity. Why is it they've done it that way? How can other people do this in future? You look up and realize that a large hill stands between you and the castle. Stood at the base, you're not sure if you've got the energy to push on, but you decide to anyway. You're so close to the end after all. But you'd forgotten that in the final moments of any quest, of any feature, of any push towards something, that can require more energy than ever. Just when you're tired, weak and weary, you need to push that little bit further to reach your goal. In Dungeons and Dragons, if you push on constantly without resting, you become exhausted, which directly affects your ability to complete things to fight things, to defend yourself, to solve puzzles and challenges. So the next time you try and pick that lock, it's going to be more difficult for you to do. Now, the most important and productive thing you can do in software 
is go home and get a good night's sleep. That's going to yield more improvement than all of your fancy processes and agiles and death marches. I'm really sorry, crunch time. That's a quote from Larry Garfield that I couldn't agree with more. So often at the end of a project, everything goes into crunch mode where it's, let's just throw as many hours at this problem until it is fixed. Let's just take all of the effort we can do and just push, 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 which sometimes can work. But in reality, what that means is you've just burned your team out trying to get this fixed. And yet you won't give them more time to recover when the feature's done. It'll just be straight on to the next thing because we've got more stuff to do. That crunch time sometimes can have its place, but more often than not, you are not going to get anything more done by staying until 10 p.m. than if you just went home at a regular time, got a good night's sleep and carried on in the morning. You might type more code, you might write more things in that time that you're spending into the evening, but it's not gonna be as good. The quality is not gonna be there. You're gonna introduce more problems. Every developer, I'm fairly certain, if they haven't experienced this at some point, they will experience it in their career. You've been facing a problem and you've bashed your head against it over and over and over again and you can't solve it. And then you wake up the next day and within five minutes of walking into the, the office and sitting at your desk, you work out exactly what the problem is and you fix it and you're like, oh, that was really simple. Why wasn't it that simple before? That time to rest and use your let your mind rest and recover and sleep and focus on other things gives your subconscious chance to process the problems that you've been facing during the day. I've lost count of how many times that sort of thing has happened to me. You've made it to the castle. It's abandoned, cold and empty. And you're walking down a dark corridor. Torchlight all that shows you the way. That's when you turn a corner and see it sat upon a plinth, the gleaming, shining, bright blue gem. You found the crystal of financial viability. You approach the room, and apart from a faint hum of magical energy from the crystal, you can't hear anything. The rogue rushes forward, steps up, and swiftly swipes it from the stone upon which it is sat. Upon which it is sat. Everything's quiet. And then you hear a faint click. Suddenly a number of arrows fire from holes in the wall, hitting your rogue and dropping them to their knees. The crystal rolls from their hand across the floor, coming to rest at the cleric's feet. In your excitement, and at the final goal, you'd realized you've missed the most crucial step in all of your adventuring and all of your teamwork. You always check for traps. It's not over until you're back at the tavern enjoying ale and telling tales to the local bard. You might see your goal in sight. You might have it just at your fingertips, but that doesn't mean you should let your guard down and doesn't mean you shouldn't be vigilant and allow sloppiness in at the end of your code. Even where you think you'll need to be, monitoring and production once that feature goes live, making sure that it's doing what it should do, that's still a part of the feature and a part of the task. Just because the thing that you've developed is now on a server does not mean it's over. The cleric holds their holy symbol and the light, light of their beloved deity blesses them, helping them to heal the rogue and mend their wounds. The rogue thanks them, rolls their eyes knowing, yeah, they forgot to do the thing that they said they always would do, check for traps. The fighter picks up the crystal from the floor, places it in their bag, and the team makes their way out of the castle. Their journey back to the tavern is a quiet one in comparison to the journey that they took to get there. They've learned from their mistakes along the way, They've seen the path that they've been down and they know what to avoid. They chat about the quest and walking into the distance, they realize surely they won't make the same mistakes again. Once you've completed your task and reached your goal and that feature is done, don't just move on to the next thing. Take time to reflect on the things you've learned, the things that you liked, the things that you didn't like, the things that you want to do more of. What went well? What didn't go well? Take that time to consider what you can do better next time because that will aid you long term and over time you just build up this little rapport and idea of actually each time we want to do better than we did last time you know guaranteed next time the road goes to that castle they're going to want to check for traps your effectiveness will increase with this sort of thing it's not the sort of thing that happens quickly but that time to reflect be retrospective about what you're doing that is almost as important, in some ways, if not more important, 
than the actual task itself because the next time you come to do something you've agreed upon as a team you've talked through what everyone liked and disliked the fact that the rogue didn't like that is obvious but what if someone didn't like using the rope to cross the river because they didn't like the way it worked that's a chance for them to express that and talk about how you could do it differently next time you need to look for balance in your team both in skills and alignment everyone having the same set of skills doing the same thing is not going to go well check in regularly with everyone in your team make sure everyone is on the same path in meetings, just make sure that every so often you just check in that everyone has understood what's been said and can raise any questions that they might want to ask. Don't just rush off thinking that everyone is following you. You always have choices in the things that you do. Just because someone tells you to use the mighty block of chain to solve your quest doesn't mean you have to do that. Start with rules, then bend them, break them. Look at ways that you can make them work for your team to increase your own effectiveness. Just because it works for another big company doesn't mean it works for you. Your team dynamic is different to theirs. You have different people. You have different experiences. It's not going to work for you just because it worked for them. Use your past experience to make sure that when you're facing the unknown, you're as well prepared as you can be. Because that past experience will help you prepare for the unknowns that you might face. You've got something to hold on to and something to tackle. Some wizards can have their place only if they share knowledge and they're not the smart-ass know-it-alls who hoard everything for themselves. And don't be sloppy even to the very end of your task. Just because the code is on the server and it's in production or it's deployed out to people's machines or you've you know, built that latest release and push it to people's phones or whatever it might be, doesn't mean it's over. You've got to keep being vigilant day in, day out. Thank you very much.